A few weeks ago, we produced a video talking about Duramax engines from the LB7 all the way up to the L5P. And in that video, we covered some of the engines before the Duramax, which are the 6.2 and 6.5 liter Detroit diesel engines. And that got me thinking, how far back does Detroit diesel go? Where did they come from? Where did they go? What did they do in between? And what are they doing now? Well, the storyline of the diesel engine itself starts in Europe in the 1800s, thanks to a man named Rudolf Diesel. Detroit Diesel didn't start until about 1930s here in the US. So sit back, get comfy, get your popcorn, because today I'm gonna tell you everything you need to know about Detroit Diesel and their full history. To understand where Detroit Diesel came from, we need to rewind the clock a little bit to 1929 before the company was ever formed. Right at this time, the US was recovering from the stock market crash of 1929 and General Motors was focused on acquisitions since companies are cheaper to purchase after an economic crash. Luckily for GM, they were in a good financial position to scoop up companies for pennies on the dollar, and that's exactly what they did. General Motors was really looking to buy a diesel engine manufacturer, and they were heavily interested in a handful of companies, including Cummins, but ultimately settled on purchasing Winton. At that time, Winton was well known as the premier builder for diesel engines in workboats and yachts. But before that acquisition happened, Charles Kettering, one of the smart inventors of the automobile industry, was approached by Alfred Sloan, who at the time was the president of General Motors. Alfred wanted to build diesel engines and figured Charles Kettering was the right guy for the job. Long story short, Charles Kettering, like many automotive executives, had a yacht, and his yacht had a Cooper Bessemer four-stroke engine. He did not like the performance of the engine, and after trying to rebuild it and improve upon the injection system, he gave up and decided to motor swap his yacht to a Winton engine. But he specifically wanted his Winton engines to be equipped with unit injectors, but Winton was not fond of this idea. Ultimately, Winton did put unit injectors on their engine for Kettering, but they were basically garbage and failed immediately. So, with that in mind, Kettering insisted that General Motors develop their own unit injector on Big Bertha, which was a big, single-cylinder, two-stroke engine. Eventually, Kettering and General Motors figured out the unit injector and got them to work well, and then put them onto the Winton engine in Kettering's yacht, and they immediately went on an 18-hour cruise where those newly designed unit injectors gave them zero problems and worked almost perfectly. Jumping back to 1930, Charles Kettering began his own research into a two-stroke diesel by having Winton build two single-cylinder test engines for him. One of those engines was shipped to Electromotive Company, who GM bought around the same time that they bought Winton, and the other engine was sent to Kettering's lab in Detroit. Ultimately, it was all a success, and Winton started producing a ton of big engines for use in things like submarines, for the Navy, trains, and much more. But in 1937, GM changed things up, and Winton effectively became the Cleveland Engine Division, which would continue to produce marine and stationary power applications. That takes us to 1938. One year after forming the Cleveland Engine Division, they formed the Detroit Diesel Engine Division. The idea was basically take all the R&D that they had done with the large two-stroke engines and shrink it down to a smaller platform, one that wasn't meant for marine, locomotive, or stationary use. That takes us to Detroit Diesel's first engine, which was the Series 71 engine platform, which had a target application of construction, military, and standby generator use. The Series 71 engine platform was available in three sizes at its initial release. You could either get a three-cylinder, a four-cylinder, or a six-cylinder engine. It's also worth noting that the Series 71 wasn't just a shrunken down version of the two-stroke engine from the Cleveland engine division because shrinking down a massive engine down to something much smaller creates a ton of issues, especially with lubrication. Luckily, Charles Kettering is very persistent and he was able to figure out these issues and the first Series 71 engine was produced in 1937. Moving back up to 1938, Detroit Diesel ramped up production and around 700 engines were sent to GM's truck and coach division. Then in 1939, the engine was sent to various suppliers for use in their applications one of which was the Alice Chambers tractor. Fast forwarding a little bit, the Series 71 was used all across World War II, and by 1944, around 62,000 of these engines were produced. As you can imagine, producing that many engines in such a short amount of time isn't particularly easy. And at its peak, Detroit Diesel could barely keep up with demand, 
even after massively scaling their staff. Long story short, the Nazis were defeated and Japan had the power of the sun dropped on them twice. With so many Series 71 engines being used in military applications, there are literally hundreds or potentially thousands of them scattered all over the world in that old military equipment, since obviously not everything is brought back after the war. As an interesting side note, I'd like to highlight that all Series 71 engines are supercharged, as a two-stroke diesel cannot naturally draw air in, so some sort of forced induction is necessary for the engine to function. For those of you who are into the hot rod world, this is where the famous 871 blower comes from. After the war in the 1950s, Detroit Diesel introduced their new Series 110. What made this new engine series so much different than the Series 71 is the fact that it was only available in an inline six platform. Gone was the idea of a platform that scaled up in size by adding cylinders. And nearly the same time, they also introduced the Series 53 engine. The 110 was marketed as a more powerful alternative to the 71, and it was used in construction equipment, rail cars, and more. After the war, railways really started to fall off in popularity and importance, as on-road trucks began to boom in popularity as the superior solution for transporting large amounts of goods. This coincides with the Federal Aid Highway Act of 1956, which had a huge impact on in-city travel as well as interstate travel. As such, transporting goods on the road became much easier, and that's what partially created that big boom of heavy-duty trucks. Unfortunately, Detroit Diesel was a little late to the party. They really didn't shift their focus towards producing commercial truck engines until 1955, and by that point, Cummins had a massive lead on them, with the majority of commercial trucks using Cummins engines. Funny to think that GM had the opportunity to buy Cummins back in the 1930s, but ended up passing up on them. Still though, Detroit Diesel got to work offering their engines to heavy duty manufacturers, and they were very quickly adopted. Even with the new Series 53, Detroit Diesel needed something more powerful to keep up with the Cummins engines. So, in 1957, they introduced a new variant of the Series 71, but this time it featured a V configuration. It was originally launched as the 6V71, which was a V6, but that was quickly followed up with the 8V71, 12V71, 16V71, and much later, the 24V71. As compared to the original 71 series, the V configuration engines offered quite a bit more power since displacement was massively increased with all the additional cylinders. You have to remember that all 71 series engines have the same amount of displacement per cylinder, so 71 series engines with more cylinders will always have more displacement. Jumping forward to 1962, Cleveland Diesel was moved to GM's Electromotive Division, which meant that Detroit Diesel was the only remaining partner of the GM Diesel Division. But in 1965, GM Diesel Division was reorganized into the Detroit Diesel Engine Division, and by 1967, they were able to celebrate building their one millionth engine. From there, they merged with another division under GM, but this time it was the Allison Division, and that division was responsible for producing transmissions and gas turbines. They merged together and created the Detroit Allison Division in 1970. And between 1970 and 1980, Detroit Allison grew quite a bit, and it started to take away some of the market share from Cummins. And they grew even more once they dropped their Series 60 line of engines. And in no time at all, the Series 60 became the best-selling diesel engine for Class 8 trucks in North America. Fast forward to 1988, shortly after the introduction of the Series 60, and Penske and GM began working together and ultimately created a new organization known as the Detroit Diesel Corporation, with Roger Penske holding a majority ownership stake in it, and under his command, they grew at an even faster rate. In 1993, they produced a whopping $20 million net income, and in the same year, they were listed on the New York Stock Exchange as the DDC. It was at this point that they controlled about 33% of the on-highway truck engine market, with the majority of it still being held by Cummins. It might not seem like it, but considering their on-highway market share was once 3%, growing to 33% is pretty insane. Through the 1990s, Detroit Diesel Company continued to grow, now as a public company, and it wasn't until 2000 that there was really any change, which is when Daimler Chrysler acquired Detroit Diesel Company and placed it under their Daimler Truck of North America umbrella. Now, depending how strongly you feel about a parent company's nationality, this move would have either made you really mad or you would have been totally fine with it. Because Detroit Diesel, 
the company that had massively helped in World War II, the company that helped with the explosion of the commercial truck market, the company that employed tens of thousands of U.S. employees and was partially responsible for America becoming such a superpower was now owned by a German automaker. It's almost like a slap in the face to those who believe in U.S. made products, but at the end of the day, at the time, Detroit Diesel had outgrown their small roots. When 2005 rolled around, the Detroit Diesel Corporation made a big investment in their own company, spending over $300 million to refurbish their production plant and tooling. With the refurbishment, crazy growth, and insane progress happening all at one time, they also released an entirely new engine line, which was the DD engine. This includes engines like the DD13, DD15, DD15TC, and DD-16, which are all still being produced today and used on commercial trucks all over the world. Moving up to the current day, Detroit Diesel Corporation has continued to grow and develop, launching several new concepts along the way to help with emissions compliance and ease of maintenance. Arguably their biggest development has been their blue tech emission systems. They've also expanded their ideas past just commercial engines, and as such, renamed the company to Detroit to show that they're more than just a diesel engine company. And as no surprise, they're pushing to get into the electric commercial truck market. Whether or not you believe electric is the future is a topic for a different time. It's pretty crazy to think that a small company from the 1930s that blew up in the commercial truck market with their two-stroke diesel engines is now moving towards diversification and electrification. Today, they're offering parts, a full lineup of engines for commercial applications, and they're also producing transmissions, safety systems, and much more. If you guys enjoyed this video, be sure to please give it a big thumbs up. If you think there's anything I forgot to add, anything you'd like to add, or anything I said wrong, please let me know down in the comments below. While you're down there, get subscribed so you don't miss out on future videos. Check out some of the other stuff on the channel, and I'll see you guys in the next one.